day at the hotel working on some stuff for the congregation. Good evening, everyone. And how are you? And how are you? Good evening, everybody. This contest gets started, but I want to thank each and every one of you for being here tonight. We appreciate your presence very much. We've had a beautiful day in Middle Tennessee. We come together at the end of the day to study things pertinent to God and His Word and our service to Him. Thank you for coming to this community Bible study. This is the eighth year that we've been having a community Bible study. Every year this midsummer session is sponsored by the College View Church of Christ here in Columbia, Tennessee. We would invite you to come to our regular services. We meet on Sunday for Bible study at 9.30 and worship at 10.30. Our Sunday night service is at 6. Our Wednesday night Bible study is at 7. We'd love you to have you come at any of those services. Our location is on Hampshire Pike. But probably the easiest way to describe where we are is to tell you that we're just right straight across the highway from Columbia State Community College. Easy to find. We'd love for you to come. We also do a thing on the internet every Thursday night, and you can sit at home uh, in front of your computer screen and join us for the virtual Bible study. You see there on the screen a notice about the virtual Bible study. That's at 8 o'clock every Thursday night on the internet. We'd love to have you join us for the virtual Bible study. We talk about all kinds of subjects, all kinds of Bible subjects on the virtual Bible study, and we'd love to have you come. As I said, this is the eighth year that we've been doing the community uh, Bible study. Uh, we always look forward to it. A number of you have visited with us in past years, and we're glad that you have come our way. Uh, as you were coming in, some cards were handed to you by the young folks. We want, to use, we want you to use these cards for several purposes. If you didn't get one, by the way, if you'll raise your hand, we'll see that you get one. Some of the guys will get you one. Uh, first of all, at, there's a place for you to put your name and address, your U.S. postage mailing address. And that would accommodate if you would like to have audio CD copies of the lessons from this year's Community Bible Study. Uh, put a check mark there uh, that you'd like to receive the audio CDs. Uh, also, if you'd like to be on our mailing list for future Bible studies, check that box. We'd like to have a record of you being here, and we'd like to be able to send you notice in the future that we're having another community Bible study. So use it for that purpose, if you will. We'd also be glad to, to meet with you privately and have one-on-one -on -one Bible studies, and if you'd be interested in that sort of thing, you can hit the checkbox for that as well. There's also a place where you can uh, put in for your email address. That'd be a great way for us to stay in touch, too. Um, so use that card that way. I wanted to mention, up here on the stage uh, are some printed pages. Last night, uh, Brother Aiken got several questions about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he worked today and put together a document explaining the Dead Sea Scrolls. And if you have an interest in that, there are copies up here that you can pick up as you're leaving this evening. Our speaker this year is David Aiken. David comes to us from Frankfort, Kentucky. We're pleased to have David and his wife Darlene us for the Community Bible Study this year. David is a gospel preacher and has been for many years, but he's also uh, a Ph.D. in biology and has taught at the university level for many years. He's retired from that now, but I'm not going to tell you how old he is. But he has retired from, pre, uh, from teaching at the university level, but he's got a lot of experience and, and especially qualified to speak about the kind of things he's going to address to us tonight uh, concerning creation and evolution. And we look forward to what he has to say and, and uh, encourage you to give a careful listen to those things. So we're just ready to get started. Let's have a, a brief word of prayer as we begin. Our dear God in heaven, we thank you, dear Father, for this good day that we have, for all the blessings of life that we've enjoyed. We know, Father, every good gift comes from you, and we praise you for all the blessings that you give us continuously. We thank you most of all, Father, that you've made salvation available through the blood of your own Son, Jesus, and we praise you for this. We thank you, Father, that for our opportunity to come together tonight in this community Bible study. We thank you that we have this privilege and opportunity to meet together in such a time as this, in a place like this. And we pray that we will listen carefully to the things that Brother David will speak to us, uh, that we'll be open to the truths that will be revealed uh, from your word. Uh, and we pray, Father, that we'll be ready to apply your truth in our lives. 
Bless us all, always, Father, as we seek to know and do your will. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother David. <clears throat> Thanks. Well, I'm going to say again what I said last night <clears throat> and Greg said last night. This, uh, this number of people to come out on a workday evening or night or however you look at this, depending on whether you're doing late shift, this uh, is amazing to me. It, it's, we kind of get used to our services, you know, one being on Wednesday night. We, we're accustomed to doing that. But to do this and to have so many people visiting, uh, I've considered it an honor that I was asked by the congregation to come. I certainly hope that the information is helpful to you all. Uh, but thank you very much. Really a blessing. Thank you very much. Uh, when Greg was explaining to me where the building was, <coughs> uh, you know, he, I know he was saying Columbia State Community <laughs> College, but after he got through Columbia Steakhouse, I never heard anything else. You know what I mean? I was thinking, I'm going to eat well at this meeting. And, uh, and I did eat well. <laughs> I did eat well tonight. Now, I can't do all of what I do in the full series on creation and evolution. It's just not possible. Uh, and I'll explain why when we get into this topic. I first started looking at this closely. I became a Christian when I was 21. I had started out as a, a pretty solid ag agnostic. Uh, I really didn't know too much about the topic, even though I was in biology. And so uh, when I took the, the just your regular uh, evolution course, and I made an A in that, but it raised a lot of questions for me. When I got to my advanced evolutionary theory class, <coughs> I really was paying attention when it, with everything that I read in my book and everything that I heard in lecture. And uh, I probably was the minority in the class of eight people and the professor and so on. Uh, I was never treated badly. Uh, I, I really was not treated badly. But I kind of developed all of these thoughts when I was in that class because of the professor coming in with this one chart that said these are the evidences for evolution and he went down through six of them and we covered them in the class. And uh, you know, he asked me what I thought of that and I said, I don't know. And I'd highly recommend to you that you don't try to fake an answer to something. You know, you're just going to get yourself in trouble. It's better to just say, you know, that's a good question. I'm not sure how I would answer that, but give me some time to study about it. And so from that point on, I really focused in on this. And for those of you who have ever met John Clark, um, you will understand that when he was there ministering and I was there in, in graduate school, the two of us just paired up, you know, uh, and started working on this together. So um, I'll only be dealing with one part of that chart. I'm going to be dealing with the similarities that we have with animals, okay? Uh, and that will serve as a sort of a launching pad for any of the others that you may ever hear because my main points in my introduction will come in this particular session. And there's several that I think young people have to know. They just have to know them. They don't think about them and they're not going to be taught this in school. So it's just something that I think is important for everybody. We need to prepare our kids to go to school. We need to prepare our kids to go to college. You know, you don't want to give up your colleges to people who simply are all against the Bible. You know, it just, you can't do that. You know, you know it'd be nice to work in a business where nobody, there was nobody there but Christians. Right? That isn't where you work. You know, where I worked in, when I worked in the factory during my, uh, my master's days, you know, uh, I was making GE air conditioners. So if you got a GE air conditioner in the 
1968 time and it rattles, that was me. I dropped one of the five screws that I was supposed to put in with, a, with an electric screwdriver <laughs> as the thing passed me. And, you know, they never, uh, they never pick those out of there. They just shoot hot wax in the bottom of it to keep them quiet. Anyway, it was probably me. So, you know, th that was not a place where I met, ever met a, another Christian. So it was a really interesting experience for me. But, you know, I have great appreciation for people who do factory work. So I just want you to think about what we're doing to prepare students to go to college. Because those of us who are older are the ones that God holds responsible for that. And most of the things that they might run into are totally predictable. They are things that we could help our students to understand. One of them is this, this issue that we're talking about tonight. Now last night we had a lot of questions about the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I want to give you sort of the bottom line on that, but these are up here. Please feel free to take one off the stage as you run away. I'm sorry, as you leave tonight. Okay. <clears throat> but the, bo the bottom line conclusion on any of the literature is that up to the time they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they only had manuscripts that were like a thousand years uh, older than that. And they, that was what was used to support the Hebrew Old Testament. But when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had a whole new account of the Old Testament. It was a very old, thousand-year gap between the first manuscripts and this, this particular uh, manuscript that they found in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, the, last night we were talking about the fact that scribes had to be exceptionally accurate. So one of the questions that we had was really this idea of uh, how, who was checking them, how do you know that they didn't make a mistake, and so on. And I told you that their job was just to do, just to do the art, and they looked at writing as art, and the letters as art, and they were supposed to put that same thing down on a piece of paper. Well, I'm not, I don't know if that actually convinced everybody. However, if you start cross-checking the manuscripts that, say, have John 3.16 in it, I don't care whether it's from Spain or Turkey, and I don't care how many hundred years it was after the first manuscript, it will always say the same thing. And uh, that's important. You know, Greg and I were talking about this, and he said his illustration has always been, you know, recipes. Recipes. Guys eat it, but the women want to know how to make it if their husband likes it. And so they pass recipes around. You know, there's people who make certain things like banana cream pie for a potluck. It's like, I really would like to know how to make that, because my husband ate half the bowl. And so, basically, you have maybe four people that are given that particular recipe, and then it's around for years and years and years, but you'll find out that very few people will mess up on that. It's a recipe. There's not much you can mess up on that without ruining the taste. So, if one person says, you I'm not exactly sure why this is in there, and then they compare it with other people, and the other ten people they compare it with don't, don't have acetic acid capsules or something in that recipe, then you know that that is the one that's wrong, and they rewrite theirs, and that's fine, but with the Bible it's just incredible. You've got 20,000 manuscripts, and they're all over the world, you know, a thousand years after Christ. And every time you get to John 3.16, it always says the same thing. Well, that's what the Dead Sea Scrolls did for the Old Testament. Basically, they had a very old, excuse me, it was a very old 
in terms of the original manuscripts, that thousand years that was in there. And in that time, the bottom line on this is that the Old Testament has been accurately and carefully preserved. 95% of them use the exact same words. 95% have the 95% of the Old Testament has the exact same words in both of those documents a thousand years apart. Now that, that pretty much nails down this idea of scribes being very, very careful. And the 5% that are not there can be attributed to things like uh, different sm spellings of words or perhaps somebody puts a letter in upside down. They're, they're not significant in any way. So you might have something like when Hannah took Sam Samuel to be uh, dedicated to God, she took with her a bull, but in some of them it says three bulls. And so is it significant to the people in the Old Testament or for us whether she took a bull of three years or three bulls? And that's a one-letter difference. A one-letter difference. And that's pretty much the kind of thing that the, the other 5% are about. So I made, uh, Darlene and I made this up today, just the short version and the person who has the long version of notes on this particular topic is Greg. So you don't have to call me, you call Greg. And, and he will let you see these notes that, I, that we put together. Now let me talk about this, uh, I'm not sure whether I turn this on. Well, this is really good streaming. Anyway, there it is. Okay, so what we have here is, I want to start with one thing. I want to know how you would answer this particular question. Do you have a very specific statement that you would make on this? How many people know what you would actually say? One or the other. How many of you did not get to eat tonight? I'm sorry. Can't get far into it, Greg, without that happening to me. Are you an evolutionist or a creationist? Well, what that does is it couches this whole issue in an either-or situation. And it's been, it's been taught that way. You are either this or you are this. And so sometimes uh, I prefer the title for my lessons, Evolution versus Creation, is there a middle ground? Now, a lot of people think that's going to go straight to theistic evolution, and that's not where it goes at all. All right, so I, I've been asked that question for a long time, and finally, I just said yes. I do. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you some about evidence and how it is interpreted from two different points of view. Evidence doesn't belong to anybody. Evidence doesn't support theories. Evidence actually can be used by anybody. Think about a court case. You've got a defense attorney, a prosecuting attorney. Do they have different sets of evidence? No, they don't have different sets of evidence. They look at the exact same stuff. Who wins the, who wins the trial? <laughs> the person who can explain it more reasonably, more completely and eliminates the explanation given over here. So what if they both turn out to explain it great and neither of them can eliminate the other person's position? What do we call that? Hung jury. A hung jury. So then you would have to believe on faith which one of those people you believe. Because nowadays it'd be on the internet, it'll be Twittered, you know, all of these different things that will come out on the internet. And it will be from one point of faith to another point of faith. And you'll have to make those decisions on your own. So I want you to know that there is one theory of evolution that is absolutely supported by the Bible. And I keep trying to get people to use the terms that would separate them. 
by saying chemical evolution or natural selection, special evolution, or general evolution. Because natural selection is real. And almost all of the examples that we get in our textbooks to give our students all the overheads that they make for us or all the PowerPoints that they make for us to teach our students, it's, not, it's just going to be the theory of evolution. And all three of them will be lumped in together. So the one thing that we can do is, first of all, learn that evidence doesn't belong to anybody. If they say, well, where's your evidence? You say, same as yours. I just believe it's more reasonable to be, believe that an almighty God created the heavens and the earth. And they say, well, you believe that on the basis of the Bible. Well, it doesn't make any difference. That's a piece of evidence that you're ignoring. You, you know, you're just, you're not letting the Bible speak for itself. So, um, you'll see that in a minute. But this is the answer that I give now. So, that's what I'd suggest that you start out with, is learning how to say, yes, I do. Because then they'll want to talk to you some more. How many scientists would get very far talking with anybody if they just said, no, I'm a creationist? Would their colleagues not say, oh, well, then you're not an evolutionist? And then you, you know, that's just not true. Are you a creationist or an evolutionist? Yes. We're going to try that once. It's not no, it's yes. Are you a creationist or an evolutionist? Yes. That was poor. We'll try that again, okay? <coughs> Are you an evolutionist or a creationist? Yes. There you go. Now, you need to let me show you why, okay? It's very important that you understand what the Bible says here. So that's what I do. I want you to look at this passage because you all know it. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that's in you. You know, and people, they kind of look at this issue and say, I don't have to know anything about that. That's not my responsibility. But if somebody that you're studying with says, well, what about the theory of evolution? You can't just say, God didn't require me to talk to you on that. Because this verse has always been there. You have to sanctify or set aside the Lord God. We have to do that in our hearts. It has to be the center of how we live our lives. It will answer every problem and question you have in your life if you will let the Lord do that for you. I think sometimes we just forget about the power of God and Him willing to help us any place we go, whether we're alone or not. Come on in, guys. Whether we're alone or not, He's going to be there to help us but we need to ask him that. We need to make sure that we have that belief in our hearts. And we're going to set him apart in our hearts as something exceptionally special. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason. They're not asking, well, what do you believe on that? They're asking you a reason why you believe. That's a very different thing. It took me a while before I got away from that, that habit of saying, uh, well, th that's what you believe, but this is what I believe. Does that mean anything? It's absolutely ludicrous. It doesn't mean anything. Now, when you come down to it, if somebody asks you a question and you say, well, I'll tell you what, let's, I want you to look at some of these passages here. So why is it that we don't want to do that? Because we don't want to talk about this and we don't want to have to do the study that would lead up to talking about it. However, just remember this. If you have something come up about general evolution that you don't know the answer to, they have my telephone number. Call me up. Let me talk to you. Let me clarify what the question is that this other person is struggling with so that you perhaps can help lead them to the scriptures which will lead them to God but it's, it takes time to do that I remember one time uh, 
uh, some Bible people came to the door, and uh, I heard this friend of mine say, <clears throat> no, I know what you believe, and shoot him away. But then they came back, and they said, you don't care much about our souls, do you? They just didn't want to talk about it. This Christian did not want to talk to these people about their belief. You just shoo them away, because obviously they're wrong. Why are you not coming to my door, was part of what they said. Why are you not coming to my door, if you think that I'm wrong? Just think about that example and what that means to each of us. Still have to live our lives. We still have to, still have to work. We still have families and friends, and even if you don't get married, you've got lots of responsibilities. So, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready to always give an answer to, to a man that asks you the reason of the hope that's in you. Now, there's something missing off that verse. Nobody knows it? With meekness and fear. Does this sound like somebody who's red under the neck and screaming and yelling at somebody? I don't think so. And just because somebody disagrees with you or has a wrong concept from the Bible doesn't mean that it has anything to do with you at all. That's a discussion between that person and God. And you need to get them back to God in the Scriptures. And you must do it with meekness and fear. You know, if you've ever been to a meeting at church or someplace else, and everybody's hollering at one another, and they're all red in the face, and you can't make sense out of what everybody is saying, that's not Christian. That's not the way Christians deal with things. You deal with it calmly. You deal with it rationally. You deal with it with meekness and fear. Quietness and fear. All right, so that's where that one is. Very important principle to have in the first time. You have a reason, faith, and we do it with meekness and fear. Our attitude in discussions is extremely important. So these are, this is the way the titles of the books are. I remember, I remember one time, <coughs> in order to verify this for myself, I went to the Internet and went through the first 50 pages of Evolution and Creation. I just wrote in Evolution, Creation. That's all I put in. And there was not one book, no, I put in books on evolution creation, in 50 pages, 25 at a time, not one title made it anything other than an either-or thing. Every title made it an either-or discussion. So people who study it on both sides, if you fall into this trap, you just fell into a trap that Satan put out there for you. So let's get past that. It all goes back to this age-old debate about a supernatural creation versus a natural creation. Supernatural does not mean that the laws of nature uh, are, are held back. It's not like nature and the natural laws are not a part of that situation. You think about Jesus walking on the water. I believe by forgot that was there. I believe by faith that Jesus walked on the water. All right? That's where I am in my life. I believe on faith that Jesus walked on the water. So, was it real water? Or were all the laws about water and air and sinking and so on suspended at that point in time? No? Just another little force in there from God from the outside. One more force that we can't account for. It, and we call that supernatural above nature. Was it water? Yes. Did he walk on it? Yes. Did he have sandals on? I don't know. Okay? But the point is, his clothes, and even Peter had enough faith at first to be able to do it. And, and I can almost hear this in his mind. Not sure why I decided to do this. This can't happen, and down he went. But the point is, supernatural things do not mean that you, that you suspend the laws of nature. It just means that God put another force there that we do not understand through our science, 
And if you don't realize that the Bible is based on miracles from beginning to end, you don't understand the Bible. So once you throw the miracles out, once you throw the miracles out, you might as well just throw the book away or burn it. You can use it to start a fire in the winter. You know? This is a normal, this is a very old debate, okay? So for me, it was can a modern scientist actually believe the biblical account? So there's three theories, chemical evolution, special evolution, and general evolution. I believe that God created, okay? But he created a world. We have a world that has physical laws, you know? One of my friends that's here tonight, haven't seen in a long time, and he's a structural engineer, which I think he means he engineers structures so that they won't fall down. Was that simple enough? Thanks. Okay, so God was the structural engineer for everything that's on this earth, and he set up the laws that take care of everything on this earth. At some point, he's just going to remove his power, which is still here, and it's just going to disappear, just be gone. But the spirit of mankind will not be gone. You and I, in a spiritual form, will st still be there waiting for the judgment. So it's important to think about what this means. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and I believe that. On the other hand, in general evolution, they usually put chemical evolution on the front of it. Chemical evolution is, is different from general evolution. It starts with no life, and then it has to create life. You get life from no life. All right? So we have never been able to prove this, ever. You know, there are experiments that people have done that theoretically they said it actually... Uh, this is actually proving that life can come from non-life. I'll talk about one of those in a minute. But th look at this. Th this is a very, very old, uh, famous, famous geneticist. Okay, Ernst Haeckel. He said, if you do not accept the hypothesis of spontaneous, if we do not accept the hypothesis, <laughs> hypothesis of ge spontaneous generation, I... You know, it's on the computer. I can read it there. Of spontaneous generation, that means of life from non-living matter, then at least at this one point of the history of the development or evolution, we must have recourse to the miracle of a supernatural creation. So here's this dyed-in-the-wool, born-again evolutionist who says, if we can't get life from non-life and prove that that can happen, then we believe on faith. At least at that point, we believe on faith. So this is not an evidence thing here. This is a faith thing. All right, so here we go. We have, I love this magazine. Where did everything come from? It says the, the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero, nada, and as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that had come from absolutely nowhere. Here... How is that possible? Ask Alan Guth. His theory of uh, inflation helps explain everything. Now, this is going to give some kind of theoretical structure to the idea that this is possible. Nobody has proved this. And this is an honest statement. I was really amazed to see this from a scientist writing that up there. All right. Now, this is the experiment. All right. So we have, this, we have this particular experiment that was done by uh, Miller and Urey, where they basically took the elements they think were in the atmosphere when the Earth was first formed. They don't know that. They think it was formed because these were in the atmosphere, and there were sparks, and they came together, and they produced things like amino acids, carbohydrates, and so on the stuff of life for us, okay? And this is his apparatus. But what he has here is a trap right there. That's not just for a sample. 
it's a trap that if it's not there, none of this works. And you say, well, there's no oxygen there because you have to have an atmosphere with no oxygen before it would ever work. And you know why? Because oxygen is an oxidizer and it will, it will kill all of the molecules that you have. It'll just destroy them if you can't find a place to trap them. So there has to be a trap there. That's what a lot of the discussion's about. Now, Einstein got a little irked at the way people talked about him. I love this quote because it's so straightforward. And it also shows that people will take somebody like Einstein, who is brilliant, and make him say something he never said. He says, in view of such harmony in the cosmos, which I believe, he believes, which I, with my limited human mind, am able to recognize, there are yet people who say that there is no God. Pretty straightforward statement. But what makes me really angry is that they quote me for support of those views. So here's Albert Einstein. He's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And he says, I wish they'd stop lying about me. I wish they'd stop lying about me. Because he says, the fact that there is this kind of harmony does not mean that I do not believe there is no God. That's the kind of thing that is a very sad, sad thing. Okay? So let's start the creation week. It was a miracle, right? It was a miracle. Brought the physical world into existence. It was seven 24-hour periods that are talked about. Six for the creation and one where God rested. Lots of discussion about that. Lots of stuff you can read. When you get done, you won't know any more than this. You want to know why it's seven? How do you know whether a day is a long period of time or a day? What do you know about language? Let's just say English. Is that close enough? When you say day, does that mean in my grandfather's day? Well, it could mean that, couldn't it? In my grandfather's day, he was born in 1873. In my grandfather's day, things were a lot different than they are today. Okay, and you understand the statement. But how would you know and, and write so that a reader would know you meant a 24-hour period? What would you put in there? What would you modify the word day, day with? Morning and the evening, you'd name them, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. You'd call them the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh day of the week. There is no such, there is no cosmological thing that has seven days in it, like the year. We do that on the basis of the earth around the sun, okay? But you don't have that for seven days. It's only because there was a statement made about a week in the Bible that we have a week, period. All right, so it was seven 24-hour periods. All right, we named them. We, uh, well, all the things that we just added to it, that's what we do. And then it was finished. Now, that's what people like. They kind of skip over this and what the Bible says. But I want you to think about Psalm 33. If you look at Psalm 33, starting in verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. How'd that happen? I don't know. If the Lord explained it to me now, I probably wouldn't understand it. But if he really explained it, there's not a scientist today who would understand what he was saying. So I don't know. But it's something that I hope I get to ask the Lord after this life is over. If I still care. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, all the host of them, by the breath of his mouth. What's that? I don't know. He gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap. He laid up the depth in storehouses. So you see what a great scientist he was. And what does it go on to say, though? Not that he was a great scientist, but let all the earth Fear Jehovah, and let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. 
he commanded and it stood fast. Does that sound like a continuing process? Doesn't to me. Do you understand the word of the Lord doing this and the breath of the Lord doing that? No. But you can understand that when he said it was finished, that it was finished. And that's what a lot of people just don't understand about what they're looking at here. The scriptures say this. This is, this is not, oh, I thought that was mine. The scriptures say this. This is not David saying this. All right? So it was finished. Psalm 33, 6 through 9. So what's the disagreement? The disagreement has to do with what evidence we decide as a group, no matter your position, to put on the table. So general evolutionists and those who believe in the Word of God and how it explains that just put the same evidence out. They put the evidence out on the table. All right, so... How do you arrange that evidence? There's always an arrangement to that evidence. There's always a sequence that a prosecutor or defense attorney uses to go through that evidence. All right? This, that they believe supports their position the best. All right? And then how are you interpreting that particular arrangement? There's not, a, there's not a court case out there that does not do this same thing. You know? And we are the jury. There's... in. Be, because I'm a Christian, I have faith that God is here. He's in this room. He created everything out there and everything that's ever been made from it. How do you interpret the arrangement? Now, this is what my professor brought in to me. He said, David, this is the evidence for evolution. There's comparative anatomy and physiology, which we'll talk about for a while. Vestigial organs, genetics, paleontology, fossil men, the age of the earth. I deal with all of that in my longer series. But I'm just going to focus in on this one. And I want you to remember that as a young Christian, you know, I'm talking about being 21 years old, and I'm standing with a professor who, when he first heard about my possible belief in the, in the creation account in the Bible, walked up to me and kept backing me up and backing me up, just screaming at me until I walked into a, a lab table. And there were other graduate students around. Nobody said a thing. This is the guy that was going to give me my, my grade. You know, but he did apologize that, for that later. So let's look at comparative anatomy and physiology. Is that the evidence for, is that evidence for evolution? No, it's just evidence. Evidence doesn't support theories. You create a theory to explain the evidence that you see, how you've arranged it, and how you interpret it. That's what theories are for, to interpret data. The data is anybody's. Okay? So here's the judge. Defense, you have this... Uh, you have two lawyers that are intent on either making this person obviously guilty or innocent. That's the way they interpret the evidence. Can they do it another way? Sure they can. But here's the evidence. It's all piled up. So there's a couple of ways. You can believe in a natural creation and general evolution and exp try to explain this, which they can. I know, I know what their interpretation is. I don't think it's accurate because it leaves a lot of things out, particularly the Bible. There's nothing wrong with letting the Bible defend itself, to let it get up in the, in the, in the wit, I mean, get up there with the, what we call the dock. You know, to let the, let the Bible get up in the dock and defend itself. All right? And here... I believe in a supernatural creation and special evolution. And I believe that I personally can explain the evidence better than this one over here. So let me just give you what I'm thinking about. Oh, I couldn't answer that question and I told him that. Give me some time. When I came back, I had this chart. I took his chart and I realized that all of this belonged to me too. Just a question of how I'm going to interpret it. This is the evidence for creation. 
And that was one of the insights that I had. I don't know why, where it came from. It just it was there one day when I got up. So this. The issue is not fact versus faith. Do you hear that much? Fact versus faith. I believe on facts and you believe on faith. No. But everybody does that. Which position of faith is more reasonable based on your interpretation of facts? Doesn't mean that anybody else has to believe it, but which one do you think is most reasonable? When you take everything that you know about the earth, everything that you know about people and how they interact with one another, everything that you've ever learned, which position of faith makes more sense out of all of that? Well, I believe that the Bible does, the Bible's position, and I believe that's what it was. Six-day creation, God rested on the seventh day, and I don't know how. I don't know how all that happened. I just know what the Bible says. And it is the only creation account in all of literature that people take seriously today. You know, it's not like a goddess who cut off the head of so-and-so and blah. That's not the way it works. It's just the only creation account that anybody takes seriously. So, then you have these evidences for creation. Now, the general theory is this one that everything came from that inorganic source, that's that chemical evolution, and then, then became what we are today. Okay, that's that so-called amoeba to man kind of idea. This is kind of this is kind of what it looks like. I'm not going to talk about that, of course. So let's just look at evidence. All animals are alike in being composed of protoplasm, living stuff organized as cells. You that? Is that you? Three trillion cells in your body when you're born. Sixty trillion in your body right now. How you doing with that? Did you count them before dinner? Probably, probably not. But your dinner was exceptionally important for those tr trillions of cells that you have in your body. Okay? You find that the larger groups of animals... Oh, so that makes us just like the animals. Lar larger groups of animals, although they may be unlike in their outer appearance, have similar organ systems for digestion, for excretion, and other necessary functions. You can take a valve from a pig and put it into a person in their heart and they can live with it. It's that close, doesn't create problems. My father had one of those. Okay. I know people who have brains that are from a pig. No. That was a joke. <laughs> it was a joke. Pig brains, never mind. Probably shouldn't have done that when I'm being streamed or you just listening to it. Many basic similarities are there, so what about that? What is it? I'm listening. Man and a horse. Similarity there? Sim how can you argue it? Why in the world do you think that medical students and dental students and anybody else who's going to work on a body starts out looking at a frog skeleton? What's the purpose of that in, law, in, in, uh, in our biology classes? Kill all those frogs so you get the frog legs for dinner? No, you got it because the skeleton is almost identical to ours. That's how similar we are. You can count them. Now, these are embryos. All right, these are microscopic, obviously. Sperm and egg came together to form these. But I want you to look at what they actually look like here. You know, even at the early stages, you see similarities between, like, a chicken and a human. Okay? And there's times in here where it looks more like a fish than it does a human. And when you get down here, you begin to realize they all sort of look alike. Now, why would that happen? Why would God do that? Because the chemistry of life is all based on the same four molecules. Everybody has to have carbohydrates, amino acids, for their proteins, fats, oils, I mean, the lipids, 
they, that's what you have to have. That's why you ate dinner. So you thought you ate dinner because you were hungry and that was a great place to go. No, you ate dinner because you keep needing that stuff. Because that's the stuff you burn up for energy. Trees do the same thing. They take their sugars and they burn them. They get energy out of it. Every animal takes their food, burns it to get energy out of it. Well, wouldn't that mean that a lot of the chemical pathways would also be really similar? Yeah, photosynthesis and respiration. They're literally the same thing in any organism that you find them. You know, you burn your sugars, you get your energy. In plants, the sun creates the energy to make the sugars. And everybody lives off the same thing. Basically, I'm, I'm sort of a vegetarian once removed because I like my vegetables in the form of a cow. It just, <laughs> that's where I'm going with that one. Okay, so these are very, very similar. So a general evolutionist would say, can, can you not see that this similarity means they came from a common ancestor? Does that make sense to you? Made sense to me. Don't believe it. That's not the reason. To me, as a Christian, the reason is because God created a living system, a web of life, where everything is dependent on everything else, and all the same molecules are needed, and that means that the chemical pathways that uh, burn sugars will be the same everywhere. You don't find any different kind of chemical reactions for respiration any place. You know, the, the ones in photosynthesis where plants make the sugars by taking in energy from the sun, they're all similar. They're all pretty much the same process. Why would that be? Not because they had a common ancestor, but they had a common creator. And that is, that is, there's nothing wrong with that. What I just said is just as valid as somebody saying they came from a common ancestor. So, that's where I'm coming from on this. So you have a fish brain. They've stretched this out. They don't look exactly like this. They've stretched them out because you've always wanted to know what a fish brain looks like after you take that hook out. Here's a frog, a reptile, a bird, and a mammal. Oh, that didn't turn out very good, did it? It's much colorfuler in my other stuff. Okay. Now I want to show you this. This is all colorful. I love this. This was a thing that I found in an uh, anatomy book, comparative anatomy book. Well, what's a comparative anatomy book? You're comparing anatomies because you're going to be a doctor and you're going to be cutting on it sometime. So you're comparing brains and nervous systems and stomachs and pancreases so that you can do a pancreas transplant and take somebody who has type 1 diabetes and it makes it go away for the rest of their life. Type 2, diet and exercise. It's just diet and exercise. So here we have it. Here are the brains of all, and look how he drew it to show you where they all came from. So what's the evidence on here? Where would you point to point to the evidence? There's evidence on this chart. And it is beautifully drawn. Whoever the artist was. Well, that's real. And that's real. And that's real. And that's real. And that's... Oh, all the outer things our brains are today. And they're real. What's this? It's all interpretation. Nothing, nothing about the brains today says that they all came from the same place. Any more than it, I believe that they came from the same creator. No difference in the two statements, except what you believe. Now, you're not going to ever believe what the Bible says except on faith. Because God created humans who can reflect on their lives who can reflect on their deaths, who have rationality. And he's asked us to trust him as our creator. Okay? He's asked us to trust him as our creator, that there's something after this life is over. But we have the will 
If we, He's given us will, free will. He's given us the ability to say, nope, God, don't want to do that. We can do it in every aspect of our life, can't we? We know what's wrong. We say, I'm doing it anyway. That was really fun last time I did it. And it probably was. Most sin in this world is a whole lot of fun physically. It just doesn't draw you closer to God. It moves you farther away. You know, if you're thrown into the outer darkness, I want you to recognize what that means. It means that you have been separated from God who is light. And you will never see God again because there will be no light. You say, well, I, I don't believe in it. I don't believe in hell. Well, then why do you believe in heaven? Same book, same reasoning. You have free will. And you know, God, God let both the Gentiles and the, and the Israelites go at it a different direction. The Jews got a law, told them on the front end, you're not going to keep this. On the back end, they were all sinners. When, when Christ came... All were sinners and had fallen short of the glory of God. Gentiles, they pretty much got to make up their own religion. <laughs> Would you put it that way? They got to make up their own religion. And they made it up all based on all the fun things they could do sinfully. Sexual stuff and so on. That's what, that, that was what their religion was all about. Whatever feels good for the day, etc., etc. That's all they... They did that and... They had fallen short of the glory of God because when Christ died for us, it says in Romans, all had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which is why Jesus came back to give you an opportunity to not sin. But my guess is that most of us will have sinned by the time we get to the judgment unless we have taken advantage of God's special gift of grace. You have to go to the scriptures to understand how to obey God. You're not going to find it any other place. I mean, I, I saw God in what was around me when I was a scout, when I was taking kids out into the woods. I saw God all around me. I didn't know what it was, but there was a unifying peace to nature. And I couldn't help it. But, you know, I, sometimes I hear people say, well, I can worship God just as easy on a golf course as I can in church. No. Because there are specific things that God's asked us to do. We don't go to church because we have to go to church. We go to be with people of like precious faith who are trying to get to heaven, who are sinners. We're all sinners. Just remember that. Don't be judging anybody else because that's, that's God's job. You don't have a right to do it. So, evidence and interpretation, okay? So now Randy, by use of song, the male sparrow will stake out his territory and instinct common in the lower animals. Sorry. Okay, okay. you have to get this because this is Gary Larson. This is not David Aiken. <laughs> Gary Larson always was able to see the humor of making us like animals. We've staked out our territory with all our fences and instinct in the lower animals. All right. It was all a conspiracy by fence makers. Did you know that? That's what that was all about. Now, the kids will not know what this is about, but for those of us who are a little older, when I was in college, we used to stuff as many people as we could into cars or into telephone booths. And now nobody knows. We, you sort of know what a car is, but you don't know what a telephone booth is. We don't have very many of those around anymore. So, but we could get sometimes 12 people in a telephone booth. That's a lot of folding, I want to tell you that. And why? <laughs> I didn't want to study. <laughs> that was why we did it. I don't really want to go study. So I want you to look at this. This is what is proposed as the 
common ancestor's hand. Well, you know, the frog hand and the human hand are really, really alike. But all of these, you see the similarity. So why would they be so similar? Because God created these animals with the same cells, same chemical reactions, same physiologic characteristics, you know, bones the same way. Bones have to be made of, uh, from osteocytes and osteoblasts. And he created it that way. We're all a part of that great web of life. So, this is what I want you to read off of this with me. The conclusion is inescapable that the limb bones of man, the bat, and the whale are modifications of a common ancestral pattern. The facts admit of no other logical interpretation. Is that not a pretty clear statement of evidence and interpretation? What did they leave out here? They left out room for somebody to say, I've got another interpretation on why God would do that. Now this Volpe book was like the evolution book in so many classes, even English classes, they would have their, uh, their students read Volpe's book. I'm not sure why, you know, but they stuck it in a lot of classes, right? Anthropology, obviously, you see all of that. But I want you to see the arrogance of that, okay? You know, the idea is that you cannot escape the conclusion that this is why they are similar. They came from a common ancestor. And those facts admit of no other logical interpretation. That's pretty dogmatic, you know, coming from a born-again atheist. That's what that is. It's dogmatism from their point of view. Now, I understand all of that. Been there, done that. So I just want us to go through and think about this special theory of evolution, this natural selection thing. Who knows what the superbug's all about? What's that statement mean? When you hear the word superbug, what do you know? Pardon? I'm sorry. A Volkswagen. A Volkswagen. <laughs> a Volkswagen. Okay. You realize you got a better laugh off of that than anything that I've done tonight? That was great. I'll steal that. Trust me. I'll steal that. Okay, there's this theory that many plants and animals have... Uh, you can actually observe this to happen. Natural selection, you can observe it happening. So in the hospitals, you know, we're always spraying them down with antibiotics and disinfectants. And we kill off all these populations of germs. So once you've done that, why do you have to do it again? Killed them all off, didn't you? Oh, well, no, you're right. You can have more germs come into a hospital, right? You can have more things that could hurt people. Got a lot of people in there with stuff we've never seen before. Yeah. So you spray again, and you spray again, and you spray again, and you spray again, spray again. You wipe everything down again. Now, in the population of germs, who is going to survive all of those things that kill them off? The strongest one. That's how it would be said in, in natural selection. The strongest one. Str fit, strong. <laughs> I can't get that one out. Don't ask me why. Maybe I'm a little warm here. Don't blame the heat in here on me. It is not me. Okay. Survival of the fittest. Boy, I tell you. I'm sorry. You'll understand when you get my age. Okay. <laughs> So over the course of time, you undergo these changes so that you get new species. Yes, you can get new species of germs. You just keep putting stuff on a population, not on an individual. People think that individuals can evolve. No, we have ranges of our abilities, and we can increase the range. Uh, how many of you are athletes, trying to be athletes? What are you trying to do, dear? I can't hear you. Okay. They are sufficiently embarrassed. I'm trying to hide. <laughs> okay, so let's just say that you're dealing 
with wrestling or you're dealing, let's just take basketball or football. Is football big down here? Sorry. And, and the team that you, never mind. I'm not going to say the team that you root for. Okay, so football's big. So how many football players, when they get to the pros, have evolved? Or have they stretched their abilities within their, the possibilities that they had genetically? They've stretched their abilities, so there's a range. They have not added any genetics. They've not added anything that could change them like that. But we have these variables. If you go live in Alaska, when you come down here in the middle of the winter, you will not wear a coat. You acclimate. Acclimation is another one of those things. You just acclimate. You've been here for a few winters, and when you go up there, you come back down here because you can't stand the cold anymore. All right? Special theory of evolution. So this is what I believe the Bible says is true. So don't let this get thrown out like you throw the baby out with the wash. So let me just show you that. Got all sorts of cattle. Darlene and I were in Jersey, which is in the Channel Islands between France and England this summer. That's where the Jersey cow and the Guernsey cow were actually bred by artificial selection, a word that goes back to Darwin's natural selection. You may, I always put, hate to put this up, but there's some sick feeling I have. Cabbage and Brussels sprouts and kale, kohlrabi, wild mustard, broccoli, cauliflower, all the things that turn my stomach. Okay. They, all, they are all just bred that way, off the same gene pool. So there's a wide spectrum of things that you can get from this. Now, I don't mind looking at wild mustard in the field, but I only use mustard on hot dogs. That is absolutely it. So I want you to think about Darwin's finches. The fact that you have gotten different finches, or even species, that doesn't say that you're going to go from a reptile to the finch. It doesn't say anything about these big jumps that people say have happened. You know, the bird, the insect, man, we're all just first cousins from the reptiles. And the reptiles are all just made up of old amphibians that have changed through evolution. So there's the deal. Now I want to show that to you. It's true with the, uh, with the fossil horses that we find. Most of them are really in the same layer, but let's just say they were strung out like that. People do that with the horses. Does that mean that the horses came from a reptile? No. Has anybody actually shown that a horse can come from a reptile? No. Have they ever shown that a butterfly can come from an amphibian originally? <laughs> it sounded like a yes, but I don't think it was. You pinched him. Her. <laughs> okay. Dogs. Artificial selection. Why do we have so many different kinds of dogs? I honestly don't know. We are suckers for a dog. I'm telling you. Now, they may cage lots of people in concentration camps, but if they cage your dog, you're going to do something about it. Okay? If they steal your dogs and they take them away from you, you will do something about it. Okay? So these dogs are funny. There's the, one of the world's largest dogs and smallest dogs. Now, you're not going to mix the genetics on this unless you do it artificially. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> then there's this dog who somehow didn't get enough body. <laughs> the, you know, their hair doesn't have enough body. <laughs> oh, anyway, the hair doesn't have enough body. Why? Don't ask me. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. This guy, <laughs> never mind, <laughs> the world's longest dog. They call him a, 
a hot dog. Now, I love these pictures. You know, they say that that owners and pets begin to look like one another. All right, and that's the only reason I put this in here. But this, this, well, wait, I'm sorry. That, what? That is the dog. I just want you to know. Okay. Chihuahuas. Don't you just love chihuahuas? No, I don't. I absolutely detest those little rats that bark like that and have little tiny sharp teeth. Okay. So it's like, why would evolution ever make that? I don't know. Humans have figured out why they want to make it, but I get a I get a kick out of all the pet stuff. I, I'm not against it. I just take in strays. Darlene and I take in cats and we take in dogs. Both of our dogs are strays. We're strays in the neighborhood. Now what is this, kids? Who said DNA? You're not I said kids. <laughs> oh, sorry. Her husband agrees. <laughs> She's just a kid. Okay, so this is a DNA strand. Do you have DNA in you? Okay, name me one naturally occurring animal that has no DNA. No RNA. No nucleic acids at all. There isn't any other. This, this is the stuff of life. This, we have these molecules in us, and we got one set from our mom and one set from our dad on every chromosome. We have these DNA molecules. And that's our genetics. Right now, modern chemical genetics or biogenetics has to do with figuring out whether that's the breaking place. They found this one out that that little thing in between is the gene for brown eyes. That's modern genetics. Figuring out what these little segments mean. How many genes we actually have. So, I like this one. There are four major molecules. Carbohydrates, that's sugars to you. Bread. Lipids, those are fats to you. This is, this is basically the human consumption part right here. Then we have proteins and enzymes. Well, this is steak. Proteins and enzymes. Now, you can't get all of these smaller molecules from any one organism if it's, if it's not meat. So vegetarians have to work at this. But they can get complementary amino acids like black beans and rice. How many places in the world have beans and rice as a basis for their diet? You can get all, yeah, you can, you can get all of the amino acids, the, uh, amino acids that you need out of that. The nucleic acids. That's it. It's the basis of life. It's why you went to eat tonight. So down in here, this is, a, this is one, something I would show in my beginning classes. These are the subcellular organelles, which are basically the machinery of life. Okay? I know what each of them is. It's like a big factory. It has raw materials come in, product that comes out. Happens in every cell in your body. All right, now, these are the four. And what they are is they're, all those subcellular organelles are like little machines that build certain parts of the structure of whatever it is that you want. All right? So, simple enough. So here's the animal cell. This would be the plant cell. It has about three things that you don't find in animal cells. Everything else is the same. Same subcellular organelles. I want a kid under eight to answer this question. What is it? What's the basic name for this? How about an immature adult over the age of eight? Oh, you've already answered. I'm, I'm sorry. Come on, somebody talk. You all so shy. Who said it? Did somebody say it? The food chains, and they make up the food web of life. There's not an organism that doesn't live off another organism. That's simple. 
It's just this big web of life. I love to look at what whales eat because whales eat a lot of krill. See the krill? But they also leave, eat a lot of algae, bacteria, things like that. So, that's the web of life. What can you take out of the web? What can you make go away before you break the net so that it's not functioning as a web anymore? hard to do with the spider's web unless you just get it all at one swipe because the diameter to strength it's like five times stronger than steel which you probably know because it covers your face and it's just there for the rest of the day okay the web of life oh wait a minute so why are all of these chemicals and organelles and cells why are they all the same? Well, I'll tell you, David, it's because they came from a common ancestor. Well, I suggest to you, my friend, that God created them so that he could have a web of life on this earth. Is that a legitimate answer? Is it the same evidence? Exactly the same evidence of biology. I simply explained it a different way by allowing the Bible to speak for itself. Now I'll tell you where you're going to find natural selection in the Bible. You're going to find it in the story of Laban. Oh, well, as a structural engineer, <laughs> Brother Byers, <laughs> these are the famous painted ladies in the Victorian, the Victorian houses in San Francisco. If you saw this similarity, would you think it happened naturally? Now, you have common design, common structure, commonality in all of it, similar design, similar structure. Well, if somebody came along and said, no, this happened by natural selection, you'd laugh at them, and I understand why. But the point is, this is the same thing. We're looking, we're looking at this, and we can still look at it as evidence and look at it in different ways. Because the energy that runs through those wires, that's something God created. We may be able to control it in some way by running it through wires and transformers and so on. But that, that's God's stuff. And that's used in all of these as part of the structural engineering of this particular building. So I understand that's the evidence, but there's different, there are different interpretations. And this is not a Darwin versus the Bible issue. If you look, uh, I'm not going to skip over that in a minute. I want you to understand that the biblical kind is not the species. If you look at that closely, what you're going to find in the scriptures in Leviticus is that the hawk was called a kind, and it's not a species, it's way above the species. It has a lot of species in it. Cattle are called a kind. There's more than one species of cattle. Mankind is a single species. Now that's evidence. What's the best explanation of that? Bible. Bible gives the best uh, explanation of it. So the Old Testament writers had this really modern, sophisticated understanding of this artificial selection. And that's true. All the examples that you get in your book, like the peppered moths, all the stuff you get in your book about Darwin's finches, all of that stuff is just special evolution. I like to call it special evolution because that's a good word. But it is not general evolution, and it is not life from non-life. All right, so where do you find it in the Bible? Chapters 30 and 31 of Genesis talk about Laban, when he was, uh, Jacob, when he was working for Laban, Laban kept changing his wages with reference to the flocks, what he had to have. And, <coughs> excuse me, the, sa- <coughs> sorry, the same book that gave us the story of God's abrupt creation and the destruction of the world by a flood also gave us the fact that Jacob understood he was dealing with a miracle 
he kept getting the wrong the wrong percentages of speckled and spotted and so on it, every time Laban changed his wages God changed his flocks for him now he could have I guess he could have looked at it any way he wanted, but what was his conclusion? This is not natural. So what was it? It was supernatural. Some place in there, God put another force in there. And he recognized it as a miracle. And he understood the concept of, of artificial selection and natural selection. He understood that. Back in the exact same book that tells us about God's creation of the world... You have somebody very ancient who knows what it means to have natural selection and they knew what artificial selection was because he wasn't getting the right percentages. He knew it was a miracle. That's in the Bible. Natural selection's in the Bible. So, same thing here. I want to give this to you as we close. What the Bible really talks about is kinds that didn't come back here. This is the general theory, natural, uh, a natural creation where everything starts from this original. And then all the new stuff comes off like this. But God created these kinds with the flexibility and the adaptability to maintain themselves in all sorts of environments. Okay? They just are separate. You say, but they're too much alike. No, they're separate but they still need carbohydrates, lipids, fats, and so on. They have the same chemicals, they have the same structure, not because they were created from this original over here, but because God created the kinds to reproduce after their own kind, and you can get new species out of that. So I, I really think that's important. My wife likes this. She, she always thought this was really helpful to her, because the idea of the special theory is that you get change but within limits. In the general theory, you have to take those same boxes and make things go from one box to another, to another, to another, to another. Haven't proved that yet. Now, I hope that this helps you because all, of that, all that stuff will explain why you get a superbug because all of the other ones that are weaker are killed off. The one that does resist it becomes the superbug and that's kind of what happens in plagues there gets to be a superbug we don't know how to deal with it and half the world's population is gone now that's not the wrath of God that's not the wrath of God that's just the fact that life is that way and because sin came into the world all of us have to die we don't like to talk about that, but we all have to die. And after that, the judgment. Okay? There's a lot of uncertainty in life about when we will die. But I guarantee you that not a one of us will get out of this life without dying. So the real question comes down to what do you believe about after this life? Well, general evolution doesn't have anything to help us with that. Does the Bible have something in there to help you? Yes. The Word of God, the Bible, is the only one that has a creation account that anybody believes. And it's the one that people take most seriously with reference to a loving God and an afterlife. Now, that's it. That's the end of it. So you can shut off the light or however you do that. Oh, wait. You don't have to do that. That was clever. I found that the other day. So... I want to thank you again. I've gone over on this one, and I'm sorry for that because it got really hot in here. But I hope that you have an idea of evidence versus interpretation and how you would explain these different statements of faith and also the idea <coughs> of um, just general, special chemical evolution. So how can you help on this? Somebody's always wanting me to tell them, how do you help in this situation? The next time you get ready to use the word evolution, put either chemical or general or special in front of it. Because when somebody asks you, well, do you believe in evolution? And, and you say, 
Well, do you mean chemical, special, or general evolution? Then you will have an actual discussion with them because they won't know what you're talking about because that's not the way it's taught now. Hope that's helpful. Thank you very much. I'm sorry it got hot.